Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. These episodes are like uh, 50-50. Like, yeah, we're recording really late at night. Like, it's going to be a late night for us recording, even later night editing. If this goes up before midnight, I'll be thrilled. But recording after a win is always a thousand times better. And it feels like it's happening more this year. Statistically, it is. It's a wonderful development. It's a wonderful time of year. We got the uh, little Santa hats on Ken and Mick. Brad, you've been... <laughs> You're sharing a room with the, the Christmas tree behind you. Special guest, the Christmas tree. You've been warned. I'm knocking something off of it in the middle of an episode, okay. and I won't feel bad. You know what? Every time, you always turn around in the middle of the episode. Every year, you turn around and, and hit one of the bells to see if they're real. So I will. I am expecting you to do that this year, too. Will it be today? Will it be another episode? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm currently wearing, actually... Uh, as part of the festive season of flannel right now, the custom winged wheel podcast, Mickey Redmond style flannels, uh, the official one that are still the official one that's still available on the winged wheel podcast.com slash shop page. One third, actually way less than a third uh, of this special run is left. So if you want yours, get it today. Uh, and people are already getting them. People ordered them and within a few days had them in their hands. So depending on where you are in the world, if you want to order one as a Christmas or holiday gift, now's the time to do it. Uh, and get them before they're gone because they do go fast. So wingedwheelpodcast.com slash shop if you want the official Winged Wheel Podcast Mickey Redmond style flannel. And of course, a portion of the proceeds goes to the Jamie Daniels Foundation, uh, which is a great cause. So you support a great cause. You look great. You match with Mick. These have been featured on the uh, the Red Wings broadcast too. Ken wore it. So yeah, it's a fun little thing. And I know we get a lot of demand for them, especially after they run out. So if you do want them, uh, now's the time. All right, folks. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk to you about all things Red Wings hockey, including the win that we just watched, the world of the NHL, and definitely not the net pegs conversation, because Brad may kill me. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco, and you forgot to wrap the flannels. Oh, damn it. Go ahead. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we are going to be talking about the two Red Wings games that have happened, the Vegas game uh, at home, and then the kickoff on, of the little road trip they have here which was a win against Columbus. Uh, a lot of notable storylines. Jonathan Berggren, uh, Philip Peronik. Uh, some news on Fabry. Uh, some other Red Wings news. You know, more on Huso and Adelkovic and Helberg. Oli Mata's making noise. And then uh, news from across the NHL. Uh, you know, people are asking about Brock Besser because he has permission to talk to other teams. Jordan Bennington uh, is being Jordan Bennington. Marner is being Marner. Uh, lots going on in the world of the NHL, so we'll get to all of that uh, before overtime. Before that, Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA, Part 4, the second one this season, Saturday, April 8th. Uh, that's the game against Pittsburgh. DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP if you want to get those tickets. Get them fast uh, while they're still available, and you can pick your favorite seats. We have the entire gondola booked, the upper bowl and lower bowl sections for you. So you get a discounted, a special Winged Wheel Podcast discount. On the tickets, you get to uh, sit with uh, other Wing Wheel podcast listeners and fans in our special sections. You get access to the pregame live recording of the episode featuring Ken Daniels and other special guests, uh, as well as a uh, portion of the proceeds from each ticket sold going to benefit the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So all of that, a lot more. We're going to add a, some bonus stuff for you this time. So DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. And what Brad was saying is I forgot to wrap the flannels. Two things I was supposed to bring up pre-show was yes, the flannels, and second... Uh, for all of you who are sharing your Spotify wrapped and we're on there, we love it. Like, we love to see that. It's the coolest thing in the world for us. So if you have it, doesn't matter where we are on those rankings, share it with us. Uh, we love seeing that. It's a really, really cool thing. Uh, additionally, when we were going through our own, like the podcast Spotify wrapped, I thought they had the wrong show for a second when I was going through those stats. Um, but we have to say a big thank you to this community because... Over the past year, you have made us, uh, you've put us in the top 5% of the most shared podcasts globally, as well as the top 1% of most followed podcasts globally, among some other fantastic, um, you know, statistics that were just mind blowing for us. And we have so much, uh, so many thanks to, to offer you for that. But yeah, those two things especially blew us off our feet. So thank you. And yeah, please feel free to share that, share your uh, Spotify wrapped or whatever uh, end of season wrap up um, for show statistics that you have. It's 
it's cool for us. We like seeing it. Very cool. Okay, the Detroit Red Wings have been almost boringly consistent this year. Because what did you say about the Vegas game when we were talking pre-show, Brad? Uh, we can just repeat the conversation we had about the Leaf game and just slap it into this episode right here and it would be relevant. And sometimes we say that because a conversation is getting exhausting and we never want to beat a conversation to death on this podcast. But genuinely, like that is copy paste. The Vegas game was the Toronto game. I think Derek Lalonde said the same thing. So let's recap the game. It was ultimately a 4-1 loss for the Red Wings, where I don't think 4-1 was necessarily the scoreline that made the most sense. There was an empty netter in there. Uh, But the only goal that came for Detroit was on the power play in the second period off of what I think was probably their best moment in the game, the pretty passing play from Kublik to Larkin to Sunquist in front, who who buried it. Um, That game, though, was, you know, the Red Wings were facing a top team a really, really good team who were having not their best night. So the Red Wings did carry a good portion of play. Did they, you know, swarm Vegas with really high quality scoring chances? No, I don't think Aiden Hill was tested that much. They had some, uh, but it wasn't, you know, an out of this world game. They didn't do enough to convert. Vegas was opportune in terms of when they converted, which was just, you know, we say it a lot, it's a talent issue. Vegas had the better players. They were the better team. They executed better. It wasn't, you know, exactly as the Toronto game went. I felt that the Red Wings had extended periods of play where they looked a little flat. They looked a little lackadaisical for me, personally, but they've played a lot of hockey recently, and it's tough when you play a team that good to to always look on. I, I don't know if you guys had a different read on that game, but it seemed the the title of that game was the Red Wings are who they are, and this is how they matched up. Yeah. The Red Wings, going into this month, one of the conversations we had about them is they're not going to beat a lot of these teams they shouldn't beat, so they need to beat the teams that they definitely need to beat. Vegas was not a team they should beat. Columbus was. So going into that Vegas game, I expected nothing. Detroit did what they did to Toronto, which is their defense was good, their transition game was good, they were controlling play a about as much as Vegas was. But when push came to shove, Vegas was able to get better scoring chances. Detroit struggled to get a lot of, if many, high danger scoring chances. So even though Aiden Hill got, I, th- I think by the final total, Detroit outshot Vegas, more action, Huso was definitely tested more than Hill was just because of quality of chance. And again, that's just a talent issue. The Red Wings are doing what Derek Lalonde wants them to do and what he's trying to get them to do is good and it's a good system and it's effective and it's working. Once again, to repeat what we said against Toronto, the Red Wings just don't have the horses, especially with all the injuries, to keep up with the Vegases and Torontos of the world. So, you know, am I mad about how the Red Wings played yesterday? No, they they did what they could. Of course, there's a few moments here and there that you would like to have back and some lucky breaks, like Phil Kessel getting a breakaway the second he steps out of the penalty box. It's hockey. Stuff like that, stuff like that is going to happen, so it's all about balancing it out. And yeah, when you balance out that game, it ended about the way I figured it would, it would end. Vegas is just a team at a different stage of their compete window compared to the Red Wings, and they just... Even when their stars have just average games, they're still head and shoulders above the Red Wings from a whole team perspective. So when you don't seize your opportunities and the other team doesn't, you know, give you a whole lot, that's sort of the, how the, how those games are going to go down. And it was very much reminiscent of the Toronto game in that regard. You know, this season has a lot different of a feel for me personally You know, covering this team feels different. And yeah, it's because they're winning. And yeah, it's because they have a a way different makeup uh, of the players on the team. And sure, some of it's because of, you know, Lone deploying a a concertedly defensive system. Not that Blashill didn't. But the real difference, and it kind of came to me today, actually over the last few games, you know, talking about this game that is a carbon copy of a different game that the Red Wings played. We have been used to, over the past few years, seeing a different Detroit Red Wings almost pathologically night after night after night, sometimes good, often bad. You know, a team that held their own against a top team all of a sudden got caved by, you know, the Sabres or the the Coyotes or whoever it might be. 
not that they didn't get caved by the Sabres this year, but still, it's, I almost want to say, at risk of tempting the hockey gods, more irregular this season to see massive swings in Detroit's play for no reason. Like, yeah, there are back-to-backs, and yeah, sometimes key injuries factor into, into things, but the Red Wings are playing more consistently based on who they are as a team, and for those who are asking, you know, what is Derek Lalonde doing differently or what results are you seeing other than the wins that say, yeah, he's doing better than Blaschel here or, or the the team is buying in, the fact that you're able to see a more consistent, predictable Red Wings squad is one of those indicators. Now, to, to Jeff Blaschel's credit, this isn't to dump on him. Derek Lalonde is doing this with a much better team. And you get more consistent hockey when you have better players. So let's get that out of the way. But it is nice in a way to know that the Red Wings are able to produce efforts that are consistent and up to standards, you know, against tough teams like Toronto and Vegas, especially. I feel like right at the beginning of the season, we said the Red Wings are probably going to be that tweener playoff team that finishes somewhere in the nine to 11 range in the Eastern conference. So if everybody's playing to their peak, the Red Wings should lose to all the playoff teams and should beat all the non-playoff teams. That is who they are. And the way this season has played out, for the most part, that's held up way more often than not. Because the thing that you get with consistency is you get a little bit of predictability. Yeah. And, you know, hockey's the least predictable of all the major sports. So, you know, throwing that asterisk on there. But if the Red Wings can produce a very similar effort with, like, night in, night out, what is going to happen is exactly what we talked about. Yeah, what exactly happened this weekend? You're probably not good enough to beat Vegas on a good night, on one of Vegas's good nights, but you should be able to beat Columbus. Like, I don't think the Red Wings did anything dramatically different between the two games, but they lost to the good team, beat the bad team. And the thing with consistency is not every team is 100% consistent. So do I expect Detroit to ever beat Tampa, Toronto, Boston, Florida? Yeah, I do, because if the Red Wings can have consistency and they catch one of those teams on a bad night, you can get a win because Toronto's not going to have a good game 100% of the time. Boston's not going to have a good game 100% of the time, although they are freaking trying this year. And what a team that yeah, is. Three losses in what, 20? We said they had 23 three, games, yeah. 23 games, insane. We said they only have three losses like five weeks ago. Yeah. Like, they just aren't losing. Yeah, so if the Red Wings can do 82 games of, you know, let's call it 80% consistency. They are going to win games against teams that they shouldn't because they'll catch those teams on a bad night. So again, we expect the Red Wings to beat the Phillies, the Columbuses, the Ottawa's of the world. We expect them to lose to the Tampa's, the Toronto's, the Boston's. This season has shown that so far and that's fine. That's what we expected. That's what honestly kind of what we wanted. Cause I, I think everybody, even though, you know, Hey, there's a chance at the playoffs. I think even the biggest optimist knows it was an uphill battle and unlikely. So the fact that the Red Wings are living up to expectations is such a wonderful change from previous years. Yeah. Uh, Also, something I love, we've talked about this a million times, is Derek Lalone and his press conferences. He is so upfront and honest about where the team is at. I think after the, the Vegas game, it was someone mentioned expected goals or it might even have been uh, newsy himself but he said someone's going to say oh you know with the expected goals uh detroit should have won but if you really look at the chances those weren't the expected goals like those cumulative ex- expected goals weren't really ever going to beat vegas like we need kind of better offense than that and on other nights he'll also say like hey our five on five play was actually pretty good tonight if you look at our expected goals like those were pretty honest to the play that was on the ice so he does a good job of a you know the marriage of the eye test versus analytics and you know how much I hate making that a dichotomy or like a a black and white thing. Uh, But he does a good job blending those, blending those things, speaking to the game and speaking to whether the results are actually indicative of where the team is at. So that is all just like a a cherry on top of what we're seeing from the team. So talking about predictability, you know, the Red Wings had a little bit of a tough spell there ending with the Vegas game where they lost to Toronto, they lost to Buffalo and then they lost to Vegas and, coming into the Florida road trip of coming, we were saying this Columbus game has to be a win. This is a team they just dunked on 6-1. They have to come in and beat a Columbus team that is very beatable for a lot of reasons right now. And that's what they did. I think they came out and played a good game. 
to ultimately beat Columbus 4-2. It wasn't perfect, but it's the kind of game that they needed heading into tough games. They had a bit of complacency after yeah. they got the 3 nothing lead against Columbus, and that allowed Columbus to crawl back into the game. But Yeah, Murph was saying the ice did tilt against yeah. them, and that wasn't like a, a game management thing. That was the Red Wings letting it happen. Yeah, a thousand percent. And, you know, to defend the Red Wings on that one a bit, unlike previous years, that was really only like a 10-minute stretch, whereas we've seen that game go off the rails completely in previous seasons. The Red Wings got it back. Obviously, Andrew Kopp had a hell of a shot to to turn the momentum back a bit. Um, but to circle back to that four-game stretch of what made the Columbus game so important and kind of tying it into our conversation about consistency and predictability, if you go into a four-game stretch, Toronto, Buffalo, Vegas, uh, Columbus, you we would have said, yeah, four points. That's what they need to walk away with this. They got three. Like, that's pretty close, right? Like, hockey's, yeah, yeah. Al- hockey's always going to have a little bit of variance. They took a point from Buffalo in a game where at one point they definitely should not have gotten a point. And then they took two from Columbus, and again, it it circles back to that entire conversation, so I won't repeat it. And then, you know, Columbus is one of the worst teams in the league right now. Yeah. And for a majority of this game, Detroit looked like they were outclassing Columbus, which is, again, even in Detroit's wins in previous years, not something we're used to seeing. So, you know, up until that 3 nothing. Right up to the three nothing goal, you were watching that game, and you go, "Yeah, this is, this is Detroit just doing what Vegas and Toronto did to Detroit." Like, yeah, you can try and keep up, but we're better. The game opened up with a great keep uh, by Mod at the blue line, fed it to Berggren, uh, and and, and Berggren was having himself a fantastic game. I thought it, if they had planned to feature on Berggren tonight, it they must have had to have thrown all the the tape out the window because he gave them more than enough just in tonight's game alone. I think Mickey Redmond had a, a few different highlight packages from just between whistles where he talked about just how good his hockey IQ was, his sense for where the play was developing around him and his, his ability to to make plays. So Mata had the keep at the blue line, gave it to Berggren, and Berggren found Zarnik uh, for his second goal of the year, streaking to the net. Zarnik stepping in for Bertuzzi, obviously. And that was just, it was one of Berggren's best games as a Red Wing, if not his best game. And we'll talk about him more in a little bit. Uh, and then Kubelik on the power play just ripped it from his office on the right side. It it hasn't been going in for him as much as, as I think he's wanted to lately, just the past little, little while here, but that was a no-doubter. Hronik found him. Um, Hronik getting, obviously, power play one, uh, dictating how the play moves in, in the offensive zone and and found Kubelik. Kubelik buried it. And in the second period, that 5-on-3, I think you tweeted out, Brad, the Red Wings need to score on this 5-on-3. The context being that they didn't against Buffalo, they didn't against Buffalo the other night, and it burned them. And uh, who better than Lucas Raymond to break his little scoring drought to to score there? Hell of a pass by by Philip Ronick too, and Mo Sider style, no look, look off the uh, defenders, fake the shot, and then right to Raymond, who ripped that in from a terrible angle. Yeah, it was, it was a nasty goal all around, and yeah, they had to score on that five on three because they blew a key five on three against Buffalo. And that was also, like, you know, how much do you believe in game management in the NHL? But that was Columbus's fourth or fifth penalty in a row that game. So you knew. You just knew the next two or three were going against Detroit. And sure enough. And they were all fair enough calls. No. But you just know that those yeah. calls in a different game might not have been. Like, no, for no example, they, the refs had it right to that point in the game. I, I would say the refs were having a phenomenal game. Obviously, I'm going to say that when Detroit's getting a ton of power plays. But, <laughs> but every Columbus penalty was a legit penalty. And I didn't see any that Detroit got away with. And so, but the NHL being the NHL, I don't care what happens the rest of the game. Detroit's getting the next two or three penalties. <laughs> You knew that was going to happen too, where on the five on three or near it, there was that scrum in front, and Good Branson grabbed Raymond by like the collar like inside the, the back of his shoulder pads and pulled him off and threw him to the ice. And it's like, fair enough, fair enough in a scrum, but Good Branson did enough there. And Sunquist, who, who initially went down on that scrum, I'm like, yeah, if I'm a ref, I'm throwing a minor in there just to tell him that, you know, F off, like you can't be doing this. And the fact that it was. Really, the belligerents in that were the Blue Jackets players, and none of them got called because there's already a five on three. I'm like, yeah, zero chance. The game management is coming, and the ice is going to tilt. But, anyways, it key for the Red Wings to score on that five on three before it went down to the single minor. Uh, they didn't convert on the next one, but still, like, it's important that they 
the power play gets that confidence. I think they were two for five on the night, which is huge for them. Yep. And um, the one thing I wanted to talk about with their power play to tie into another conversation that's been pretty prevalent around the Red Wings, I'd say for the last few years, but it's really crept back this year is faceoffs. Because faceoffs are one of those stats everybody fixates on, but when you actually look at overall game impacts, they really don't affect the game all that much. I'm torn on them. I understand why people look at the analytics. I, I see both sides of this conversation very clearly, and I understand where both are coming from because the true thing with faceoffs is it's very circumstantial. Yeah, of course. Because, and in the context of the Red Wings, a neutral zone faceoff off and offside, that means nothing. Uh, opening faceoff to a period, it means nothing. 90% of five on five O zone and D zone draws, like with 10 minutes left in the period. Not super impactful. Do you know where faceoffs are super impactful for the Red Wings? Special, power play. special teams. Power play especially. Detroit's power play is substantially better this year based entirely and solely on what they do in the offensive zone. This team still sucks getting the puck into the offensive zone on a on a transition play on the power play. Oh, their, they their are power play entries struggled against Vegas. They struggled against Columbus. Yeah. They are not good at that. They'd struggled for most of the year. Unironically, they miss Philip Zadina right now. Yeah. And where the Red Wings face-offs become important is, I have no stats behind this, but I am I would be curious how many of the Red Wings power play goals this year have come off a face-off one in the O-zone where the puck never left the zone. We need Prashanth on this. We need him just yeah. on the call. Prashanth, pull that up. I know it's obscure, but you can just see how much more effective their power play is when they start that power play with ozone possession. And then, because we've seen how many power plays this year where they don't score, but you look a minute and a half, minute 45 into the power play, it's still Kubelik, Perron, and Larkin out there because the puck just hasn't left the zone. And then you see the power plays where they're off 45 seconds in because the Red Wings are just regrouping the whole time. Nothing happens. And then there's a random face off and it's like, all right, well, they just had to skate four laps. They're tired. Get them yeah. off the ice. Yeah. Well, uh, the Red Wings, like like you mentioned, Brad, the Red Wings did let a little bit of offense come their way. I think there was a little bit of a lapse, especially in the Kent Johnson goal fed by Goudreau. A lot happened there that really shouldn't have. Uh, in around that time, Ben Sherratt took a puck off the hand, I think his left hand, like wrist or hand, and I was like, great, another. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you see the slow-mo replay? No. He took that right off the fingertips. Great. <gasps> yeah, that's a broken bone. He and came he, back, apparently. He came back later. It was much later, so you have to imagine something's taped. He was waiting for the, you know, whatever painkiller they gave him to yeah. kick in. Got... Oh, man, that would not feel great. No, no. And, like, we didn't talk about it last episode, actually. Mo Sider took a, a shot right to the leg. And I've harped on this podcast before. Mo Sider, it's a combination of he just has so much leg to hit because he's so <laughs> huge. And he always seems to be limping after shots. I'm like, something's up with his padding. I don't know. Um, he left the game also against Buffalo. And uh, he was in pain, like, pain. And definitely these guys are just battling through it. But also, can you imagine... Cider and then Sherratt weren't able to come back from those. The Red Wings would be in a world of hurt coming into this road trip. Shot blocking has been Detroit's enemy this year. I don't know if they, they've been loading the pucks with lead or what, but they're hitting the Red Wings so hard. I was, I've been thinking more and more. I, I really want to see Cider and someone else on that pairing. Not like screaming from the rooftops about it, but I kind of want to see it. But then Sherratt got hurt. I was like, no, not like that. <laughs> Monkey paw curls. No, honestly, you're tempting the hockey gods. He did come back. Uh, Columbus made it 3-2, and uh, Andrew Kopp actually resealed the um, the two-goal lead, but with a tight angle shot that shouldn't have gotten past Corpusalo, but did. Uh, Kopp has been excellent as of late, which you talked about last episode. Uh, that was Olimata's second assist of the night, which is important. It brought him up to nine points in the year through, I think, 24 games. Through 66 games last year, he had eight points. He did talk about he wants to have more of an offensive role, and yet yeah, playing with Veronica has helped, but man, Mata has had a fantastic season with the Red Wings. My mind has definitely flipped on Mata. Don't trade him at the deadline. No, I don't no. care that he's a pending UFA. Get this guy under contract. Unless you know for a fact that this guy wants to leave for a lot more money than you're willing to offer him, keep him. 
Yes, a thousand percent keep him. And you have to imagine that he likes what he has here. A good situation for a player is so important, right? And they're not stupid. They know if they haven't been able to find this elsewhere. They're not trying to shake something up. So I have to you have to imagine that Eisman can get him on a contract that isn't too much term, but you'd want to give him the term for security, but enough money or a little enough money where it's not gonna make a big impact on the cap. But yeah, his we talk about Kubelik being you know the signing of the offseason and cop has especially been heating up lately too but mata has deserved the credit from front to end i think one of the only bad games i've seen that pairing play was the vegas game it wasn't their night raymond had a rough night too but yeah they they turned it on and they've been excellent and they were lights out tonight again as well he's been a good calming force for philip peronic to just play his game and he doesn't have to play with an absolute boat anchor and try and play both sides of the ice I'm telling you, man, Mo Sider wants one of those. Yeah, he just needs to be the guy on his line, and he just needs someone to just anchor the back end so he can go do his thing. Mr. Predictable. Mark Mathot, what's he doing? <laughs> Tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the The Red Wings ended up winning. The two-goal lead was actually almost restored by Dylan Larkin a little bit before. <laughs> it was just so funny. Yep, Ryan, what happened there? It was offside. By how much? It was offside, Brad. By how much? I don't know, a frame, a hair. The James Webb deep space telescope was used to figure it out. Hey, that's where they put it. That's the molecular level they went down to. I'll tell you, I watched the play live and I thought, oh, that's coming back. That's offside. I did as well. So it, I'm impressed by how close it was. And I don't blame the lines. I, I give credit to the linesman for letting it go. Because I'm sure yeah. he saw it. He was like, that's a fraction. I'm not calling it. We'll see what the review says. The reviews have caused a huge problem of the linesman airing on the exact opposite of that where everything if it's close is getting blown dead so i do appreciate that he let that go credit to dylan larkin hell of a rip shame that that didn't count um but yeah ultimately it was offside and it, the fact that it was by a fraction i looked i was like i almost texted you evan i'm like oh brad's gonna punch through my face when he gets here <laughs> yep yep just just uh you know uh, offside by a hair of a guy who didn't factor into the play at all. But oh, he are. factored into the play. He was right. He's skating straight down the middle. Yeah. No, no, Brad. That's offside every ten times out of ten. I'm not getting involved in this because it's just two extremists going at one another, <laughs> and I'm not going in the middle of this. It's a shame, but the play was offside. It technically was. I'm not. You're I'm not getting Ryan. Involved. You're not wrong I'm that not. it was offside by a. By a grain of sand. You know what? It's the holidays. The decorations are up. That's in, right. In the spirit of that, let's move the conversation on. Uh, before the break here, I, I want to have a, a conversation about Philip Ronick and just how well he was playing. It's not just where he contributed on offense tonight with his two assists. We talked about this before. He has been really good by his standards defensively, too. Just after, you know, a strong offensive play, he broke up a three-on-one coming back the other way. A three-on-one. And that play does not get stopped without Philip Peronik's stick. Yeah, three. it's just maybe luck, but Philip Peronik of years past wouldn't have any of the offensive conversion and absolutely would have been without it down Shit's Creek without a paddle defensively. And this is a guy who has re-emerged like a freaking phoenix at both ends of the ice. It is one of the biggest turnarounds I've seen in a Red Wing season over season, maybe since we've started covering this show. Or started the show in covering the Red Wings. I'm struggling to think of one more extreme than Heronic, so I, I think that is probably an accurate statement. We, Who's the hottest name in the trade market and has been for months, if not a year now? Tyler Bertuzzi. Good meme. Thank you. I should have seen that one coming. Non-Red Wing. Oh. Jacob Chikrin, right? Now that he's healthy again, they're talking about it again. Arizona's asking for a King's Ransom. They want, like, the Carlson deal or whatever. Um, you know, firsts, players, prospects, that whole deal. And I think they're going to get something close to it eventually. There are questions about Chikrin, like, how good is this guy really, and can he stay healthy? The obvious context of where they were drafted aside, and maybe should we give that backstory for folks who might not know the Chikrin Hirona connection? Yeah, I'm not even sure Jacob Chikrin was the be is the best defenseman in that trade. <laughs> <laughs> the Red Wings. It was the season where Stamkos was 
Potentially. I don't don't give us a stamp coast context. I can't potentially go just, into just the I, trade. I, just give us the trade. The literal. You have to. You're and don't. To, and have don't. You said it was Christmas. Are you trying to get me upset? <laughs> yeah. And don't you dare mention who we signed with the cap space gained. Anyways, so there were there were big name free agents potentially going out there. The Red Wings wanted to extend without rebuilding, and they needed to make cap space. Pavel Datsuk had just gone to Russia, and they were on the hook with his contract. The Red Wings traded his contract to Arizona in exchange and uh, swapped picks. Yes, the final trade was uh, Detroit sent Datsuk's contract and pick number 16 to Arizona for pick number 20. And I don't remember the exact number, but a late second round pick. So we the- don't need to talk about who the Wings took with pick 20, but. So pick 16. Ended up being Jacob Chikrin, and that's where the Red Wings were going to pick. And Arizona took Pavel Datsuk's contract. Uh, the Red Wings, I think it was like Joe, yeah, it was Joe Vitale that the Red Wings also took on. Uh, Just to make the spreadsheets balance. Pick 20 was Dennis Jalowski. So the, the 2016 second round pick, and that obviously ended up being Philip Hronik. So not a, a player trade, but Chikrin and Hronik have that connection. Anyhow, all that context there. Can you say confidently right now? that Chikrin is that much better than Hironic, where they shouldn't be getting a similar return in a potential trade. And I want to qualify this by saying I don't think the Red Wings should be seeking to trade Philip Hironic unless they get an offer they can't refuse. No, the Red Wings absolutely should not be looking to trade Philip Hironic right now. You need guys of Philip Hironic's quality and age and handedness as you're trying to get better through a rebuild. He is the exact type of defenseman you want right now for where the Red Wings are. Now, the comparisons between the two, there's two ways to look at this. Have we seen both their peaks? I would say yes. And Philip Hronix is probably right now. Chikrin's peak is higher than Hronix. Not significantly like everyone would have you to believe, but he is a better player. Now, if we're factoring in consistency and injury history, those are two pretty big strikes against Jacob Chikrin and in favor of Philip Hronix. Phil Pronick is durable, plays a ton, consistent. Chickerns had one full season in the NHL, and that was the 56-game shortened season. Really? Yeah, he is injured all the damn time. So, look, I, I don't. Th- I think someone's going to overpay for Chickern. Absolutely, they will. But, but I think but he's a other... quality defenseman. I think he's a great defenseman. He'll I think, help a team. I think we're missing one huge context piece that adds to Jacob Chikrin's value. He's on a phenomenal contract. He's on a great contract. He is on an absolutely phenomenal contract. You're getting a a top two or three defenseman on your team for under, what, five? He's not even making five mil. 4.6. 4.6 for two more years after this one, correct? Yep. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal value. So that alone will boost his value way above Hronix because Hronix only got one year left after this one. At 4.5 or yeah. 4.4, sorry. Yeah. So similar cap hit. Yeah, so not that Hronik will ever get Chikrin's trade value, but Hronik's trade value right now is probably significant. I know. I just know. I, I know. I'm tempting fate by bringing this up and making this comparison, and I know there's also the backstory of, hey, you guys are being homers. Look how long Hronik struggled. But also for people who are re- a quiet half point per game defenseman, his yeah, basically his entire career thus far. Even when he was struggling, even when like I specifically have been very hard on Hrona because I I wanted him to be more as a defenseman, and I I knew he could be play, be playing as he is right now. Before, even while I was railing on railing on him for that, he was putting up that yeah, like you said, half point per game. He produces. Jacob Chikrin does have twice as many goals as. Um, Philip Hronik, which is important. I do think without, you know, going back and looking at it, I feel like Hronik's, a lot of his points are secondary assists. Like, they always felt not very impactful because I'm always saying to myself, Philip Hronik is a, f- a half point per game defenseman. How did I not remember yeah. that? Yeah. Um, not this season, though. This season is No, a, not this season. A different no. Hronik. But yeah, the, the reemergence, the rebirth, the realization of who Philip Peronik is and he's young so I don't want to be too dramatic about it but the fact that he's been able to do this at age how old is he now 25 not that a player isn't developing at 25 26 27 even 
but usually by 25, the shifts aren't this dramatic. You can see the trajectory that they were on, and it's just about getting to that place. To turn around like this, I mean, that is all, this is the exact excuse you need to be patient with players, which is advice that we could probably take when talking about, you know, Zadina or whoever else. But still, this is a, a monumental shift for Heronic. And credit to him, if he keeps this up for the next year, season and a half, a little bit more, he's going to get a big payday to stay in Detroit. One more year. Good thing he's still under team control as an RFA. Okay, before we move on, uh, I want to first let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by NordVPN. Are you missing out on a game or your favorite show because it's not available in your region? Let me introduce NordVPN. Using NordVPN and a click of a button, you can watch and browse as if you're elsewhere in the world, making sure you never miss a game and can watch whatever content you'd like. No need to travel across the continent or oceans for your favorite team when NordVPN brings them right to you. With over 5,000 server options, no game or show is out of your reach. Using the link nordvpn.com slash winged wheel, you can receive a huge discount on NordVPN cybersecurity two-year plan plus four free months. We all have to binge, but privacy is a big deal too. NordVPN keeps your information encrypted so you never have to worry about your IP or location getting out. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive website ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. Don't forget, there's literally no risk to you with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try, and if you like it, great. If you don't, they'll issue a refund, and you can pretend the entire thing never even happened. Again, check out our special promo link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, to get your discounted subscription started today. Some kind of vote of confidence in Billy Huso, but I think more importantly, and maybe uncomfortably, a vote of no confidence in Alex Nadalkovich to give Huso the start tonight against Columbus, considering who they have coming up and considering that it was the second game in two nights on a back-to-back with travel in Ned's home state. It's exceptionally rare in the NHL these days for a goalie to play both ends of a back-to-back. It's got to be even more rare when the, rare when the second team in the back-to-back is one of the worst teams in the league. Those are the games that you probably start your backup if you have two, three days in between games because, you know, you got to get the backup in somewhere, so you might as well throw them one of the worst offenses in the NHL. And, yeah, th- this was really telling of what the Red Wings coaching staff thinks of their goaltending situation right now. It's also that, you know, like we've alluded to or talked about several times, is this ha- this is a must-win game in the last seven and then upcoming four games, right? Like, they have to win this Columbus game, so they, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but they can't roll the dice no. with Alex and Delkovich and that. Like, they have to get this win. They, If he had come out and had a decent game, like an okay game against uh, uh, Buffalo, he would absolutely have had the start tonight. But it's been the whole season. You can count on one hand the amount of good games Ned has had, and I think you can probably count that on half a hand, how many true 60-minute good games. So... <laughs> Brad's two showing. and a half good games <laughs> <laughs> Brad's showing me some fingers right now that got risky <laughs> you can't you can't blame the coaching staff like Ned is not playing as he can he is playing probably the worst hockey of his career right now I think a lot of what happens to him in the upcoming next little while is going to be dictated by what they think of Helberg down on his conditioning stint in Grand Rapids and also what they think about uh you know, if Ned does get in against Florida, Tampa Bay, uh, or Dallas, which I would be surprised if that was the case. That's a lot of games for Huso. That's what would, it'd be five games in seven days if they did. Get, He's got to get into one of those, I think. Unless they make a decision sooner. The conditioning stint will end at some point. They can go back, like we talked about last episode, they can go back to carrying three goalies. The, the Bertuzzi injury changes things. But uh, the, yeah, he's he doesn't have a lot of rope left. And then the question is, I don't think, like, uh, hypothesis here, let's say they do get to a point where they want to give Hellberg a look, a look over Ned, and for whatever reason, they're not scratching him. I think they're more want to waive him because what team is picking him up at $3 million right now based on how he's been playing? I think there's a few. The NHL is a big league. There's 31 other teams, and... 
how many teams do you think are super confident in their goaltending tandem right now? I bet you can count that on less than two hands. Yeah, but how many of those have the cap space and have general managers or owners who want to be spending that much on a guy who's been bad this year? No, you're you're right, and I don't think there's, you know, just based on the cap situation alone, I think you can cross off 75% of the league. Um, and I'm not intimately familiar with most teams' cap situations, so I don't know. I just look at goaltending ca- tandems and go, oh, that can make sense. Oh, that can make sense. Like, just as a fail-safe injury replacement, et cetera, et cetera, like, First team that jumps to mind, again, I don't know their cap situation. Vancouver just lost Demko for six weeks. Spencer Martin's their starter, and they had just dragged themselves back into the playoff race. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm not saying they would. I'm not saying they can, but if I'm Vancouver right now and all of a sudden a free goalie who is probably better than Spencer Martin at the very least uh, becomes available to you for free, it, you'd be hard to pass up on that. But again, if they're a capped out team and you know the two or three other teams that might be thinking the same thing are capped out, is it worth trading a player or waiving a player to free up that cap space for a player of who's playing to the level of Alex and Delkovich right now? No, probably not. But if you're sitting there with the need and the cap space, yeah, you probably roll the dice because he's a UFA at the end of this year, so you're not on the hook beyond this season. And for a team... Like Vancouver, who are at that crossroads in their season, we're either getting it together now or writing off the season anyway. Well, uh, it's it's also tough too because what would you even get for Alex Nedeljkovic on the trade? Like, That's he's not thing. playing well. He, teams, you know, teams aren't you know only watching their team. Like they're going to have some indication that the Red Wings are up to something with their goaltending because they're bringing on Halberg, who's established himself as the starting goalie. They know something is up with Alex Nedeljkovic, and they're not going to pay up. I, I'll say premium, but you you get what I'm saying. Like yeah. they're not going to pay a premium to get Alex Nedeljkovic. They're going to probably assume that they can get him for almost nothing or nothing. Quite honestly, that and at that point, the gambit becomes if the Red again. This is all a big hypothetical where the Red Wings are in a spot where they really want to try Helberg over Ned, and there's no spot on the in the press box or sorry, uh, up in the box for Ned as a healthy scratch, then the gambit is, do you take that fifth or sixth round pick or whatever it might future considerations, or do you just gamble, send him through waivers, and see if he gets through? And okay. then he spends time in Grand Rapids, and maybe he he gets his mojo. This it, it, it reeks of a confidence issue with Ned. Like The goals that are going in, very few of them I find are, oh, he was very technically unsound there. There's a fundamental flaw in his game. It's like, no, there's a puck that was like dribbling through and it somehow went five hole. Like this is a guy who's double clutching everything in terms of goalie movements. I know goalies listening are punching through their windshields right now. Like Ryan does no idea what he's talking about. Yeah, but it's it, it, it just seems like a confidence thing. So you send him to Grand Rapids. You hope he gets his mojo back. I understand what you guys are saying. Like it's not impossible for him to get picked up. I just think it's as likely as it will ever be that he would clear waivers. If if there was ever a time that he's going to clear waivers, it's it's now. It's, this is as low as I think it. Well, as low as I hope I it, it would get oh with, God, yeah. with him. Um, I, and, and but looking at the schedule, where do you put him in? Like, there's no confidence game at all. I there's well, there's no such thing as a confidence game for Alex and Delkovich right now because if you're talking about how to get Nedeljkovic's confidence back, I don't know how to do that, and I don't know what the answer is. I can tell you what won't get his confidence back. Getting shelled by Florida or Tampa, or Send, Dallas, sending or him to the AHL. Oh, so it's, oh, great! There's no win scenario here. Uh, there, yes. the I honestly, if I had looked at the schedule and went, this is the get right game for Alex and Delkovic. This is where everything's lining up to. A, it makes sense for him in the schedule. B, it's a bad enough team that even if he doesn't play great, he might still walk away with like a two goals given up win. It was today. Unfortunately, I think the next opportunity for that is uh, looking like the seventeenth against Ottawa at home, and uh, that's just you gotta. I think you you have to figure out what you're doing well in advance of that because that's 
You can't give Huso five games That's in like seven days. That's like two weeks away. Like They just... have another back-to-back next week with Minnesota being the second half of the back-to-back. And Minnesota's not the strongest offense in the NHL. No, but still, even before that, by the time they play the Dallas game, okay, look, 8.30 p.m. Eastern. On oh, Nedeljkovic isn't playing this week. They're going to give Huso five games in seven days, or are they going to bring in Helberg? I think they're going to play Huso. I don't know, man. If you're, you are making a state, they made their plans clear when they played him today. This was the Nedeljkovic, what do you, whether you want to call it a get right game or give Huso a break game, it was today. They don't have another back to back this week, but they do have a back to back next week. They have so Thursday the 8th is 7 30 Eastern, Sat, Eastern, Saturday the 10th is 2 p.m. Eastern. That's a matinee. That's we're we're not also a lot of time. basing this on current information, like, if the team looks sluggish after Tampa and who's really needs the rest or yeah. like, there's so much nuance on a day-to-day basis and new information that comes up that would, you know, force their hand on whatever situation. But yeah, man, who's having to play five and seven. That's, that's a lot. And I these... mean, I believe like he, technically he can, his technical ability can carry him through that kind of workload, but man, does that make it tough? Yeah. Not only are all three of these next games on the road, not only are they all good teams, like, you know, the 95 Devils were a good team, but they weren't exactly an offensive powerhouse. These are three offensive powerhouses. These are not going to be light workload games. So, Why? Who does Dallas have that's doing well right now? Nobody. <laughs> um, but The nice thing about two of those games is they're both in Florida. Nice for who? So Huso's got to play these starts hungover or what? Yeah, I was going to uh, say. I mean, the fact that they don't have extensive travel between oh, the two yeah, games. Yeah, like yeah. They, they're basically in Florida. They're, you know, can kind of get their feet under them. It's not like a typical road just, scenario. Just say he's drinking on the beach in between games. <laughs> a couple Mai Tais. <laughs> Evans, uh, sorry, I can't make the Wednesday episode. I have to make a quick jaunt down to uh, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, I'm going to play the Grove with MJ. Yeah, he has a tea time with Newsy probably. Um we could talk about who's going to start and who's not, and there's conversation about waivers in there. So very quickly, last Red Wings topic here. Actually, a couple other things. Uh, Robbie Fabry, back January 1st, which is huge. Um, I It's my understanding that he's actually recovered really well. They're just playing it safe with him. So they're they're waiting until they're certain he, they're going to minimize re-injury risk, especially because his ligaments, poor guy, did not hit the genetic lottery with how those things tear. You know how when an elastic gets really old, and it, I just assume that's his ACLs. He's a cyborg, half man, half machine. Honestly, at that point, that's great. I think the best news for Robbie Fabry right now is he doesn't have a third ACL. Oh <laughs> 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 uh, well, he's retorn one. What did they do for Dad? No, this they, was his, like, this was his cadaver other... ligaments and like yeah, in up. his ankle. That... Yeah, that's pretty common. Is it really? Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, well, I just shouldn't say. How would you common. know? You're not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> wow, look at that. We wrapped up this episode in under an hour. This is the content you get at eleven o'clock at night. Yeah, that's third. That's three ACL tears for Fabry, right? Yeah, that's that's Fabry's third ACL injury. Just had to confirm that, but because uh, he's had so many, they just blend together at this point. But three for him. You feel bad for him. So, anyways, they're playing it safe, which is good. He's back January 1st, which will be hopefully a good bit of depth scoring for the Red Wings lineup because they're not going to play Columbus every night. So they're going to need some more depth scoring. Uh, also, for those who are looking forward to watching Marco Casper at the World Juniors, don't expect that. They are not going to be uh, sending him. He's going to be staying with the uh, main squad with the um, the men's team and basically outplayed his time at the World Juniors, it seems. Jonathan, Be- Jonathan Berggren. It's staying Berggren. I know folks have linked me to that conversation. I'm where... not saying it like that. I'm just <laughs> respecting what he th- what he said. What he, he said he said every he said something different every time. And I think in that interview is also like, oh, I don't even care. Like whatever people want to call me. Yeah, no, it's but, like okay. okay, okay. But he said to like he said to broadcast teams Berggren, and then when they said that, he said, oh, you're actually saying it right. So that's his like that's the way he says it. I think he's just not a stickler about damn swedes like being way too accommodating <laughs> too nice yeah. anyways way too nice back to johnny bear grills yeah yeah uh Jonathan bear grin like two different words uh you mentioned brad he has to stay up now right waiver exempt i understand and yes you can move him down easier like that that's a whole thing 
but the way he's playing and what with what the Red Wings need right now and the injection of offense and offensive opportunities he brings to the bottom six right now, he's got to stay up. A hundred percent. He bet. Okay. Role placed aside. There is not an argument to be made that he's not one of the 12 best forwards in this organization right now. That's the simplest reason I can give, but five on five offense is a problem for this team. Yeah. He is one of the very few players down the lineup who is, who is consistently producing offense, not on the top line. Um, He's, you know, one of the more capable players on the second power play. I mean, he got Austin Charnick, Sarnick a goal today. Like, come on now. Um, I like Sarnick. I think he's been doing well. Sarnick's good, and he's a better player than the fan base gets credit for, but, I mean, he's not the type of guy who consistently scores goals in the NHL. And, um, you know, you watch the game today. Bergeron just has that, I know it's an overused term, that hockey IQ that, so few players have, especially on the Red Wings. His level of patience with the puck is astounding for someone his size. Most smaller players, even the good, effective, smart, smaller players in the NHL, generally get the puck and try to make things happen with pace and speed because, well, they know once you know a, a bigger defenseman gets within their range, they're going to be very limited in what they can do, if anything at all. Bergeron doesn't care. He just finds the lane he reads the defenseman. He finds what he's going to be able to do and make something happen. I think Mick was pointed out in the game today, too. Bergeron got a breakout pass at the red line where he was standing basically completely still or moving very, very, very slowly. You get the puck in that position on the ice, 99 out of 100 times, that's a dump in. And Bergeron barely picked up any speed, gained the zone, Got all the way down to the half wall and then found a, a sauce pass. I think it was Heronic who was coming down late cross ice that uh, Berggren just put two inches in front of him. Otherwise, that would have been a really strong scoring chance. So, you know, th- this is kind of the duality of a rookie because, you know, as a rookie in the NHL where he originally received that pass, that's not a spot you want to be standing still in. So rookie mistake has the skill to turn that mistake into a d- near A-plus scoring chance. Um, you've seen the the goal where, again, he gets the puck in a less-than-ideal zone, so he was you know, a few feet from the Red Wings' offensive blue line inside the zone, but skating away from the net. Quick cutback, pucks in his feet, kicks it up, waits for the... Because that pass to Zarnik, that's an entirely timing play. Yeah. Hits it perfectly, right spot, right time, into a goal. We've had this conversation with rookies in the past, but that was under the context of Jeff Blashill because at that point we were fairly confident and comfortable in talking about it because we knew what Jeff Blashill liked and like what he was looking for. And we've had the conversations about, yes, rookies and rookies like Berggren, and I'm, I'm not going to exclude him because you can see it, they struggle in some of the smaller areas of the game. Bergeron's still not especially effective on the four check. He's still not especially effective um, in puck battles. You know, he's not a defensive stalwart. These are all things that drive coaches nuts. But he has the clear talent that when he has the puck, when he's in his areas of strength, which 90% of it is with the puck on his stick, he makes things happen better than seven, eight, nine other forwards on this team. So, what we're going to find out if the, if this roster ever gets healthy is <laughs> no. does no does Lalonde value the talent more than the little things? Because the previous regime didn't. We had this, I think, this exact conversation with Evgeny Svechnikov a couple times. And obviously, Svechnikov does not have the talent that Berggren does. But Svechnikov was producing, making things happen. But he was also struggling in a lot of the same areas that I just talked about. I think that you want Berggren to be learning these problems at the NHL level. I don't think Berggren is very well served in the AHL anymore because his talent is too good for the AHL, even though he could still use some refinement on the smaller details of his game. Pains me to say, Brad, but that was a really good summary. So at the risk of repeating a lot of what you just said, 
a couple other notes about Berggren is just to extrapolate, I really like how they've deployed him. You know, they haven't overloaded him with minutes, even though at times, you're right, he's probably one of the better play creators on the Red Wings. They've been really careful with his development and how they've been rolling him out. So I like that. Uh, not that I ever thought they were at risk of playing this guy on the first line for, you know, 25 minutes a night. He gets his opportunities to move up from time to time. But they're they're putting him in very intentional situations with players who I think can complement and have complemented his play style. And talking about his patience and his puck distribution, his uh, it almost is like Perron sometimes. Like his patience and the way he kind of hangs onto the puck ready to either deke, pass, shoot, whatever. It 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 makes everyone freeze around him in a way where I think very few other players can have, you know, the the body fakes, the head fakes, or lack thereof to freeze defensemen or or the opposing players. Perron does it a lot of the same way. I think Perron does it really well, especially in the power play. And you saw that on display from Berggren tonight too. So, yeah, I, I would imagine with Soderblom's knee, or sorry, um, I think his foot still giving him problems. He's not close to returning. Even if he does come back, I, I would imagine Berggren gets a preference in terms of staying in this lineup right now. He's done enough in my mind where, yeah, there's still a lot of questions on on how much uh, of the other parts of his games, the small areas, the the board battles, that kind of thing, will he be able to win? Uh, but from what he's demonstrated right now, he brings something to this Red Wings team that I think they really, really need. Yeah, and, you know, you look at the body of work between him and Soderblom as well, I think I think Berggren's been a better player for both their stretches with the Red Wings thus far. Um, and I... I really struggled to see what Bergeron could learn or refine, you know, re- going back to the AHL. Like, he'd, he'd be the best player on the team. It, it's pr- definitely better for him to be in Detroit learning from the more veteran players, a la David Perron, who plays a very similar style to him. I think Detroit, being in Detroit, is, is where he needs to be as well. It, he's been excellent thus far, and... um I really don't think there's there's really too much more juice to squeeze out of Grand Rapids. Well, he's going to have a continued opportunity because of injuries. Brad, you said if this team gets healthy. I don't think they do. I think they're at the point in the season where it's just going to be a rolling list at this point, and it happens to every team. It's not like the Red Wings are having anything special. I mean, they just played Columbus where I think Brad Larson got hurt tonight. Like Everyone's getting hurt on Columbus. So uh, I, he'll have every opportunity. Uh, quickly, some NHL news. And I bring this up because I think folks have tagged us quite a bit in it. Brock Besser has been given permission to talk to other teams uh, by Vancouver. He obviously has quite a bit of time and money left on his cap hit. So Brock Besser, 25 years old, right winger, $6.65 million a year for two seasons after this one is a UFA upon expiry. Is Brock Besser actually good? No. Okay. Four goals, 11 assists. This season through 19 games, he's been around a 40 to 45 to 55 point player his entire career. Um, 20 goal score more often than not. 6.65 is a hefty price tag. Vancouver's gonna have to work to unload that one. Yes, um, I like Brock Besser as a player. Absolutely not at that price though. He is. Um, a below average, if not, we'll say average five on five player who relies heavily on his shot. It is a really damn good shot. And he has gone through a lot of adversity in his career, both on the ice and off to this point. So, you know, if if you're the type that believes, hey, if this guy can just get some a change of scenery, scenery and some normalcy, there could be improvement there. I'll absolutely buy that argument. But yeah, this is this is not a contract you roll the dice on with two years left after this one. Uh, if Vancouver is trading him and willing to retain some salary, absolutely the Red Wings should explore that because a right hand uh, right handed power play specialist isn't something you see all that often. So if you could get someone to slot in on the second power play unit um, in David Perron's spot. Again, to play behind Perron in the other unit, there's some value there. That can free up, um, you know, Lucas Raymond to play that lower role or the bumper role that they've been trying him in this year, whatever. There's definitely value in that. Just 
not at six and a half. Like Vancouver could go to Steve Eisman right now. You can just have him. And the Red Wings should probably say no. Unless they work out a trade with salary retained. I'd consider it for a low, low price, or if not free. I would consider it. I, I do think the Red Wings are not in a position to turn down players of some value. Um, I would want to see some salary retained, though. You're right. 6.65 is... Yeah. Like I said, I'm interested in Brock Besser. I'm not interested in Brock Besser at 6.5. Honestly, all I keep thinking is, if you're trading for someone from Vancouver, go all out. F it, we ball. Trade for Bo Horvat, who loves the Red Wings. And, Throw on Elias Pettersson and, okay, yeah. fine, we'll take him. I, I think they're they're probably smart in saying Pettersson, Hughes, and maybe Demko are, are untouchables, but everyone else is up for play. So if you can find a way to have, you know, we said it last episode, but Larkin and Horvat, and that's who I'd rather be trading for. But then now we're getting into the um, pie-in-the-sky scenario. So Sign and trade with Horvat, for Horvat, Besser added as a sweetener. <laughs> Before we get too far down, uh, speaking of antics, Jordan Bennington. Oh, my God. The most beloved goalie in the league, definitely. Stuck out his trapper as uh, Zucker was skating behind the net. Essentially clotheslined him. Zucker took a trapper to the face and slammed into the boards. And those catchers are heavy. That didn't tickle. No, and at full speed, as Zucker was going at, like, that's can't have felt nice. Look, I know if Bennington was on the Red Wings, I'd have a different opinion, but it got to the point where oh, no, even I, Craig Berube was saying, like, there's no room in the yeah, game for that shit. When your goalie does, or when your coach doesn't even stand up for you in the media, imagine the shit storm that's going on in the in the dressing room. Yeah. No, I took a peek into St. Louis Blues Twitter verse after this happened. No, Blues fans are not defending him. They're tired of him. They are sick of him. This This guy is... I hate that this guy has a Stanley Cup to his name because this statement feels dumb to say, but Jordan Bennington is the biggest loser in the NHL. Oh, sorry. I, I don't want to conflate his on-ice play. He earned that cup. He carried them to that cup. He was good. He was really good. But I so, I hate calling someone who's won a Stanley Cup a loser. Oh, oh that's But what Jordan sorry, Bennington yeah. just exudes he's loser a winner, energy. But he's also a loser. Yeah, he's a you, dweeb. You, you clothesline a guy. That guy scores the fourth goal against you that game to get you pulled. And as you're skating to the bench, you rip your helmet off as he's on the bench so he can't do anything, which is very relevant in Jordan Bennington's world, and you start beaking him. Zucker had the perfect response, just throwing his hands up with the what? What are you what are you doing? Like no matter what you say, you're skating off yeah. the ice right now. Yeah. I just got you pulled. You suck tonight. Like and after what he's you know, was it a week ago he tried throwing a shoulder into Jordan Stahl and just got blown up? And he's thrown the fake punches at Devin Dubnik and Eric Carlson. And this guy is a baby. Anytime he gets rattled, he just does this stuff. He's lucky Ray Emery, rest, God rest his soul, is not in the league because I think Ray Emery would just skate over there and just beat the, beat the wheels off of him. He's I, moving so confidently, you're right, on that F around find out line. And oh, yeah. he's it, it, the uh, the F around has been quite substantial. Someone is going to do the find out part eventually. He is going to Billy get... Huso <laughs> versus Jordan Bennington. Billy Huso has the crazy eyes. He man. does. So he, here's the thing with Bennington that drives me nuts because I've seen a lot of people comparing him to Brad Marchand. You know, it really grinds my gears. Yeah, there Th- we this, go. This actually does grind my gears, and I'm I Jordan Bennington is such a loser. It's about to make me defend Brad Marchand. Okay, do you know how, how that oh, kills me inside? Brad Marchand is a little shit on the ice, and he does a lot of the things that, you know, drive you nuts. He runs his mouth. He'll chirp you. He'll do the dirty shit that Bennington does. All of that's fine. You know what I have seen Brad Marchand do a lot in his career, and I mean a lot? Fight. When someone when he does dumb shit and someone steps up in his face, Bar- Marchand will answer the bell. Jordan Bennington has yet to do that. He will always... Run, run, run when his mouth when a guy's on the bench or there's a ref there or he'll throw fake punches. You're right. He's He has got the F around part nailed. And nobody's made him find out yet. And when it happens, I feel like it's really not going to go well for him. I can think of 39 tougher guys on the, on, in the, in, on the ice than Jordan Bennington every single night. It's just part of what he brings to the... And I think, I think there's an appropriate amount of that. Like... Guys who walk the line to the point where most opposing teams hate him, 
but they're productive for your team. Tom Wilson, Brad Marchand. There have been goalies who have done it before, too. That's a little bit more old Ray school. Emery was a pretty good goalie. It's just when your own coach can't go out there and say... he got a, uh, Bennington got a 10-minute misconduct for inciting, the referee said. So, I mean, he was already getting pulled, so who cares? When your own coach can't go out there and say, hey... You might not like it, but uh, we like what he brings to the game. And if you're not even close to the line where it's not even a debate and the whole hockey world can come together, that's when you know he's screwed up. He's not going to change his ways. Something is going to happen. I'm happy to have seen him got the misconduct just to put something on paper. But, you know, if he went out there and face washed in a scrum like uh, Jimmy Howard did to Sidney Crosby, Penn's fans would have every right to be upset. Red Wings fans love it. That's hockey. I, I don't want to say get all the tough stuff out of the game. No, I love goalie fights. I, that's I love violence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can say it. I'll let you use it. But it's this is this shit's this isn't that. This is just his own side brand show. of bullshit. Yeah, it's a sideshow. As as an entertainment fan, I absolutely love it because I am the biggest fan of having heels in sport. And right now in the NHL, I don't know if there's a bigger heel than Jordan Bennington. The problem is, and I, I need to move. But it's not even here. played well. That's just no. like it's just it's there's balance to being a heel. Yeah. Somebody has to like you. I only like it because <laughs> eventually he's gonna have to pay the toll. <laughs> yeah. And I wanna know when and who and how. Well, anyways, until that episode. When does he play Milan Lucic next? <laughs> That still pisses me off. Buffalo's response to Milan Lucic when he Just, ran Ryan Miller. Yeah. That made me so mad. That 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 play, fun fact, is the origin of the punk test. Oh, is that the first time that was... That, I think it was Steve coined it after that incident. They... Uh, yeah. Don't even get me started. John and the Taves fought... To, well, tried to fight uh, Truba last night after the Athens Nisio hit. That's a great punk test, too. I would never would have... Yeah, who is it? J- John and the Taves would be in that matchup. Yeah, is it Jacob Truba's on a streak of fighting captains right now. He's a weird dude, man. He's such a weird hockey player. The amount of times he's been juked and sent flying elbow first, missing a hit has been hysterical. Like, no one should have a highlight reel of you trying to injure someone, but even failing doing he's that. He's all in, that's for sure. Yeah, he doesn't He doesn't pull out. <laughs> <laughs> now, on to the next topic. Matt Murray and pegging. <laughs> <laughs> If you cut this right, I swear to God. No, that, that could... <laughs> oh, that's the beauty of this being a podcast. Is... Oh, if that was live TV, you'd be on YouTube for the rest of eternity. I'd be wait. I would get my fine from the FCC before the end of the night. Oh, oh geez. Oh. Oh. oh my god oh, you know what <laughs> the words were forming the words were forming and i still you just can't stop them. no They're, you couldn't stop the words from happening all right folks we're gonna move on to overtime here uh before <laughs> it almost feels ridiculous to talk about something serious uh but before <laughs> overtime uh i want to talk about uh hot stove stories with mick and ken and the fantastic money that you raised uh, Ken announced on the broadcast that you cleared over a one hundred thousand dollars raised. Unbelievable for the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So that's through tickets to the event, which you sold out. Uh, you sold out the room. They added tables until they literally could not legally anymore. Uh, through the silent auction and the live auction items, over one hundred thousand dollars raised. So um, Ken obviously is over the moon. The Jamie Daniels Foundation is is blown away. Uh, massive thank you from. Uh, myself, all of us on this show, uh, that is amazing support in the Jamie Daniels Foundation uh, fight against substance use disorder. So thank you all so, so very much. And uh, we know there's going to be a lot more coming through. Wings on the Money on the Board, Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA, selling these flannels, everything else. Uh, let's keep this going. Okay, overtime. Before I say any other stupid shit. Uh, Overtime on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to help support the show. Uh, You get access to things like our special Patreon-exclusive Overtime episodes that are recorded right after these. Uh, You get access to the Winged Wheel Podcast Discord, which is always a blast. Uh, You get automatically entered into every giveaway that we do. Also, we are giving away two tickets to every Red Wings home game this season, and the majority of them are going directly to patrons. Uh, and so you can get two fantastic tickets to see the Red Wings play at the LCA. That and plenty more benefits. 
uh, patreon.com slash wing wheel podcast. If you want to know how we got to this show to the point where, you know, we're the top 1% followed on uh, of all podcasts globally, like none of that happens without our patrons. You are the heart and soul of this show. So thank you. A uh, question here from Jennifer Morris says, what is your opinion on the current lines with Bertuzzi out? Would you switch anyone? It is so hard to say right now because this is a team that is near the basement in the NHL for five on five offensive production. So I'm at the point, try anything. I, I don't have any strong opinions because whatever line Larkin's on seems to be clicking and it, it seems to work. So do with his line, whatever the hell you want. And the rest of the team beyond Andrew Kopp seems to be struggling to find any consistency. So try whatever the hell you want. Yeah, you would almost complain about the line juggling. And I think there has been a little bit more of that than what I would have expected from the loan. But it's only really happened with, like you said, Brad, the lack of five on five scoring and because of injury. You know, whoever broke their hand that game is going to necessitate something. So it is what it is. Yeah, because I don't even think Lalone wants to do it because for the amount of chaos that has gone on within the Red Wings forward lines, have we seen a change in the defensive pairings at all this season beyond just who's in and out of the lineup? Like, Hironik and uh, Mata have played every game together. Schrott and Sider have played every game together. And since they've both been healthy, I think Osterley and Wallman have not been broken up since. And so Lalone seems to be a fan of consistency just with the amount of injuries and everything at forward. I don't think he's had a choice. Yeah, the, the stuff that sticks or makes sense in a way, he doesn't break up, which I, I, I agree with you. I like. Uh, okay, question here from Keenan O'Donoghue says, do you think the Red Wings will have any movement at the trade deadline? Uh, it doesn't need to be as buyers or sellers, just movement at all. Thanks, fellas. My Winged Wheel podcast project is going well, and I'm finally in full Christmas mode. Tree, music, and movies, Ryan. Thank you, Keenan. Appreciate the support. Uh, any movement at the deadline for the Red Wings? The Red Wings are almost in that zone of, I could understand why they would do nothing. I'm going to say yes. Just because they have a lot of pending UFAs, and I, I don't think they'll be in a playoff spot then. So I'll say at least one. Yeah, I think there's still a chance that they might add. And I know that sa- that sounds insane, but there's a chance that they might add if they are close enough. It's not trending in that direction, but I don't want to rule it Oh, out. I'm on the other one. I think they're more likely to move I think, someone. I, I think they are more likely to move someone, but yeah. Uh, Mo Hits Cider says in hockey history, there always seem to be two players that are linked and compared to one another throughout their careers. For example, Gretzky and Lemieux, Crosby and Ovechkin, and McDavid and Matthews. If they both pan out and make it to the NHL, do you think that will be the case with Kosa and Wallstedt with them being such high caliber goalies and with the wings tasting, taking Kosa over Wallstedt? That will be one probably for wings and wild fans only. I don't think the rest of the league's going to give a shit. If they both make it and are fantastic, yeah. Yeah, like if there's like Vezina races between them, sure, which would be a fantastic problem. Uh, and I think uh, Wings and Wild fan will, would both hop on board for that scenario. But yeah, no, I, I don't think anybody outside of Detroit or Minnesota is going to care. Uh, Rose says, hey, guys, uh, you mentioned last episode about how we shouldn't add at the deadline unless we're in a playoff spot or close to one. Uh, however, we seem to be stagnating at this place where we don't have the talent to score uh, on the offensive chances we're getting. So with that said, is the answer free agency again? Or do we wait for our draft picks to come up and fill those roles or wait for Bert, Fabry, and Verona to come back? Depends on what type of solution you're looking for. Because if if you're big game hunting, like we need someone at Dylan Larkin's level because Dylan Larkin can't do it all himself. There's nobody in the system that's going to do that. And based on where they're likely to pick in this draft, it's not coming through the draft. So, yeah, you're going via trade in the offseason or free agency. I'm not familiar enough with who's going to be on the trade block and who all the pending UFAs are yet to have a good answer on that. But that's the likely scenario there. And I don't think the Red Wings need to add a ton of depth. I, I think they're actually pretty good there for the first time in seven years. But... They they definitely have a, a big hole near the top of their lineup that they need to fill, and free agency is probably the most likely. Ben Height says, I accept that we won't agree on the Wings reverse retro jerseys. Hold Brad. on, I'm, I'm 
I'm so disappointed in both of you. The way this episode. I going, know, I know. You there was a lot of phrasing moments in there, but I'm like, we yeah, had enough. Yeah, I, I was. I, I was halfway was, through the one. I'm like, I, I'm here now. We're we're <laughs> we're just oh, rolling I, with it. I was thinking it. I was like, I. It's I cannot 10:30. be childish at this moment. <laughs> it's 10:30. We all need to go to bed. <laughs> uh, ben Height says, "I accept that we won't agree on the Wings reverse retro jerseys, Brad, but can we agree that Columbus missed a huge opportunity to use the Hornet in theirs? The Wings are better than the jacket jerseys." The oh stinger, a yeah, thousand percent. He's got neon green, like in him. Yeah, that there are there are jersey possibilities there. I there should have been way more stinger. I don't care how little sense it makes in terms of logo and team name, whatever stinger would have been cool. Uh, last question here from No Chal or No Cal. Forgive me if I'm saying it wrong. Says who voiced the intro for you guys? I remember back when you had the Datsu clip and later a Larkin one. Uh, but don't recall ever mentioning who made this one first Patreon comment. Thank you so much for your support. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, so this is actually a uh, voice actress that we worked with uh, on this. So uh, someone just professional in the field who does it. That said, we will have a new intro, outro eventually. It's just about, you know, getting a certain person in the studio to record it, getting the right music for it. So that's a long process. We want to make sure we do it well. So if you have any opinions on how the intro or outro sound the kind of music that kind of thing uh let us know it changes are coming i also know people are very like it's very jarring when it changes they hear it and they're like mm, i'm listening to the wrong podcast what's happening so okay uh before i i say something else stupid uh let's wrap up this episode of the winged wheel podcast we're going to be back with you on wednesday so wednesday is our next episode uh, remember Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA. Get your tickets April 8th uh, against Pittsburgh. It's that game, so you can get your tickets today at DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. Link is also in the description. Also, get your custom Winged Wheel Podcast Mickey Redmond style flannel uh, that also benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Get them before they're gone. There's not very many left. Detroit, or sorry, WingedWheelPodcast.com slash shop. We'd like to thank the sponsors of this episode, NordVPN, uh, all of our listeners, new and old, all of our patrons, especially our name level supporters, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Armchair GM slash Genius, Nick Perks, Terry Driver of the number 69, Crying Ryan Hands, Banana Slam at Jamathong, Glenn Brabham, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Brandon M., Carl Brutana Nanoluski, Chimmy, Chris Ball, Chris P., Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood, Fight Probert, Red Hot Ronick, Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joseph Barry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Let's Have a Big Ol' Smooch, uh, Marcus, Matt McKay, Nindelkovich, Goalie Number One, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Send It Seawolf, The Podcasting Couch, Venom, Worse Ryan, Zachary Rogers, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, number one Detroit Red Guys fan. Adam, I wish I could finish like Ernie. Antonio Gracias, Babe Landiscog, Ben Barron, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Connor Leighton, Darren Fick, Philip Zadiz Nuts, Ronix Handlebar, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hall, Logan Burgos, Matt Keeler, Matt S., loyal soldier of the Cheesebag Army, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Overload the slot 60% of the time. It works every time. Thick Rick and Aaron Hudson. Thank you so much, folks. We'll talk to you Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.